It's 20 years. That's a long time with no league title. I think we're still in the running. You get that sense that the pressure's on up. I look at Odegaard as a bit of an artist. I think what we've missed with Odegaard not being in our team is that guy that can make that pass and hurt you. If Havertz had just scored, I'm not sure I'd have made call time yeah, today. Because you could change the narrative completely in just the space of a few weeks. But we can still win the Champions League. We can still win the FA Cup. Arsenal have stopped the rot, but we're nine points back in the title race. It's time to start winning some football matches. I'm Talia Lazarus, and this is Inside Gooners. So joining me today to discuss the Chelsea game and what it means for our season are the Arsenal Oracle, Clive Palmer, football writer and Gooner Talk podcast host, Tom Canton, Channel 4 sports correspondent, Jordan Jarrett Bryan. So we're going straight into the Chelsea game. Yesterday's afternoon's game. I just want to know what are your thoughts? I personally, I'm not too upset. I'm obviously not too happy, but I'm not too upset. What are your thoughts? Well, I'll start with my pre-game thoughts, shall mm -hmm. we? Because I think pre-game, I was incredibly nervous about this game because they're, they're, it was huge. It was very important not, not to lose. At that time, I really wanted us to win. But when I actually the game went on and we started to see a performance and we started to see our team again, I've come away from it feeling a lot more positive than I thought I would have done about a 1-1 draw away. So went through a few emotions, but I feel a lot better because I think we've seen Arsenal again and the way we used to play. No doubt we'll talk about that and the reasons why. But yeah, for a 1-1, and I, I'm just hoping the last chance is offside, but Tom's telling me it's not. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> for a 1-1, I'm, I'm OK with it at the moment. OK. Yeah, I, I had an all or nothing feeling mm. pre-game. I really felt like the title rested on this, which for a game in November is, in a way, ludicrous. But that is a result of Arsenal's form prior to this game. And the points that have been dropped, of course, and the feeling around the fan base as well. But I agree with Clive, and I felt like there was more identity in that Arsenal team performance at Stamford Bridge that had been lacking in previous games. The Inter Milan game was encouraging, but still, that was 46 crosses. And the big chances that we created in this game, while you could argue that Erdogan lofted a ball to the back post, it was it was more direct, there was more thinking behind it than I felt like there was in, in the Inter Milan game. And the chances Martinelli had as well came from kind of these low-driven balls into the box. And it was a lot more controls than I felt it had been in previous games. Yeah, similar for me, I think pre-match, I went into the game thinking this is a must-win. Um, I think it's a game that we needed to get three points from. I was encouraged by the performance. I, I thought that um, the Newcastle performance was a disgrace. I thought the Inter Milan performance was better, but still not as good as was made out. I thought for the domination that we had, the possession we had, we didn't actually create anything. There was 40 plus crosses. That's not creating chances. I think Inter actually allowed us onto them. So I think it was a little bit warped in terms of the domination we had in that game. This was uh, an improvement for me because there was actual goal scoring chances that we created. I'm not seeing that for a while. So I left feeling a little bit, a little bit more enthused by seeing the old Arsenal back, but still disappointed by the fact that we didn't win the game. Chelsea are not brilliant. They're on a good run of form and they've got a good attack, but they're not great. You want to win this title. I think this was the game we had to really come away with three points. And we were so close at the end. We're going to get into that, but <coughs> I do agree. It was nice to see Arsenal back in, in their own way. You could definitely see that, that they were coming into themselves a lot more. And obviously it was nice to have Odegaard back. Do you not feel that we missed him, you can see in yesterday's game? Well, can I take this one first? <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> I, I think because his influence, I didn't realise by how much we missed him. And it started literally from the first five minutes. And the difference is, it's not what he does on the ball so much. We all know he's brilliant on the ball but it's how he directs the team. Mm -hmm. So as he pushes forward, he's not just pressing the ball in front of him. He's looking behind him and seeing where everyone is and saying, get up, mm. get up behind me. And that's crucial. And that's crucial to chance creation. Because all that does is that creates a, a different line height. Your line height at the back and your line height at the front. If that gap is shorter, the game becomes more compact, it becomes a contest. Arsenal's team is built for the contest, to win duels, to win that contest in smaller spaces, and to be technical in smaller spaces. But if your spaces are too big, you can get run through and pass through. And that's what's happened in previous weeks. We're not able to dominate teams. So Odegaard literally owns our game model. He literally does. And I thought I knew everything about Arsenal, but I didn't realise by how much he influences 
how I feel watching the team mm. and how our performance goes. I, I think he's such an important player. Well, it's, it's like having Arteta's vision on the pitch in a player. Mm. Like, you get that sense that he's the captain. There was, I remember there was a lot of talk at the time when he was actually given the captaincy about whether it was the right choice. Mm -hmm. I remember the other candidate at the time was Kieran Tin, mm -hmm. was being talked about as potentially the, the right option. <laughs> you can see how their pathways have diverged massively since that point. And actually, you can see the decision was not only because Erdogan, you know, as a leader, the way he talks to the team was good, but it's because he acts a certain way on the field and he demands more from his players. And then he executes passes, plays crosses, plays key passes into key areas. And that's everything that Arteta wants from his team. But when he's not there, as he hasn't been, We've missed him massively. I agree, and I think I look at Odegaard as a bit of an artist. And I love the way that he's always on the half turn, his body shape always is to receive, but also then to hurt. And I think what we've missed with Odegaard not being in our team is that guy that can make that pass and hurt you. For all the qualities that Declan Rice, Marino, and Partey have, they haven't got that pass in them. And I think teams know that. When you know you've got, you've got a midfield that no one's going to really split the defence open, I think you, you, you defend us differently. When you know Odegaard's on the half turn and can make that pass, I think it affects how they play against us. And having him back in that team, just that threat alone, I think massively alters how not only we play, but how other teams play against us. So it was great to have him um, back in the team for his leadership qualities as well as technically what he brings to our team. We could definitely see he brought his flair back. And that's the thing. We obviously have been, for the last few weeks, have been saying, you know, you can see that Odegaard's missing, but then once he was back, you know, you really could feel this is what we've been missing out on. Even the assists. Who else in our team can really make that pass? Yeah. There's no one... Trossard, maybe. Jorginho, maybe. There's only really Odegaard that can make that pass. So if Odegaard's not there, do we score that goal? You can argue Saka does as well. But he wasn't there, so it had to fall exactly. on Odegaard yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So what, what Odegaard did there, because he gets the ball and he manipulates it and holds it, mm. he draws people to him. 100%. He draws people to him. Not only does he draw people to him, he allows his own team to get into attacking shape. So when he gets it, does a little flip flack over the ball, then suddenly an overlap comes. Mm -hmm. He's got it. He needs support. So I start to move. When you create those sort of overloads, it, creates, it freezes people, creates time. And suddenly, there's two people in the back post. We can all see from our set ease, but how does he see it in the crowd? Just dinks it straight over, and mm. um, yeah, he's, he's, he's better than I thought. And there are people that were saying, Tommy, you know they're out there, that were saying for a period that we were better when he wasn't mm. on the pitch. Yeah. I want to find those people. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I need to find them. I think, like, what you said about how Odegaard takes players away, that also has a knock-on effect on Saka because the amount of times teams will set up in a certain way, mm -hmm. will put their left back, their left side of centre half, their left centre midfielder, all surrounding Saka. If you've got a good enough left back, and Kukurea I thought had a, an okay game, but mm -hmm. Saka was really giving him, you know, threat a lot of the time. But without Odegaard there, as Clive said, like Odegaard pulls people towards him, Saka's pulling people towards him, and that opens up spaces for other players in the team. So that your 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 right centre mid in the case of Odegaard can push, Havertz can drop into those spaces as well that open up for him. And I felt like without Odegaard there, and especially against Bournemouth when we had neither of them, mm -hmm. you're looking around, you're looking for where's the space is going to open, who's going to pull people into different positions, and it's not there. But it's not just through their movement, it's through their aura, it's through their presence. And Odegaard and Saka are two players who are of a world-class standard that we just lack the depth to replace when they're not there. And when they're not there, that has obviously a knock-on effect on how the opposition will play against you. I think also as well, it's, it's also the, the wingers, Martinelli and Saka, that benefit from Odegaard being there. More so Saka, because when Odegaard is there, Saka gets double teamed less. Because again, to my point, teams know that Odegaard can make that pass. But Saka also knows I can make that running behind because I know there's a player on the pitch that can, that can find me and make mm -hmm, that pass. Mm -hmm. So it's not only for the team he benefits, but Saka in particular benefits because he knows I can keep making that run, keep making that run because there's a player there that I know can find me in a way that other players I just don't think can make that pass to find Saka in behind. So then we're going to just talk about Cole Palmer. He was a little bit quiet, do you not think? I, th I think he was quiet. I mean, to be fair to him, there's reports that he didn't train until That's Saturday. Mm. He's been out injured uh, most of the week, uh, the reports were. Mm. So he was a little bit rusty. However, he played, what, the whole game? He played the whole <laughs> game and, and he wasn't particularly effective. But I think in the same way that they did a really good job, Mareska did a really good job, I think, in trying to shut down Odegaard. I think theirs was less successful than our shutting down 
sorry, I think ours was more successful shutting down Palmer than theirs was with Odegaard. I, I think we did a really good job in just not allowing Palmer to get the ball where he wants the ball in the part of the pitch where he does most of his damage. There, he was rusty for sure, but I, I would credit Arsenal more on the job they did on him rather than him just being poor. There's rumours, there's murmurs going around that he's not a big game player. I think that's a little bit harsh. He has scored some big goals in some big games so far, but it's his second season, he's a marked man. So I think he needs to expect that this season, we kind of know what you're about. There will be big games where he doesn't shine, but I think overall, um, I, I think he'll be fine. But yesterday, yeah, it was good from our point of view that he didn't have a great game. Yeah, I think we blocked off the entry pass with Intim a little bit. Also, we, we kept away from our area. I haven't seen the data around us yet, Tom, but I wonder how many box entries he had. You know, I haven't got a picture of him being around our box too much. And I think he's in the box, I think he's stone cold. He can slot, pass, do what you like in there. You've got to keep him away from your goal. And I think, and when he, just, when he can't get near the goal, what he tends to do, he drops away mm -hmm. into non-dangerous areas. He almost... He almost talks himself out of his best game. And what he probably needs to do and, and learn a little bit more is to stay in those areas and sometimes take people for a run. But you don't see him running behind, do you, very often? And you don't see him off the ball when they're, they're not in control of possession. So for me, his game is not rounded. I won't rubbish him, though I have done... <laughs> oh, terrible player. Though I have done <laughs> in my private moments, I rubbished him. Because I think he's getting his flowers too early. Mm. I don't think his game is rounded, but he's got a super talent super relaxed. He approaches football in a way that kids in cages play football, a cage football. He approaches football in a really good way. So I don't think that should be really cool or rubbish. But I also don't like the chat that he's the best player in the Premier League because I don't think he is. Well, that conversation about Saka came up almost immediately because he was mm. playing, you know, last season also on the right-hand side. So naturally, fans like rivalries, not just within clubs, but within players, and you want to put those two up against one another. Saka's been doing this since he was 17 for a lot longer. He's established himself in these positions. He's established himself as a player that can take England forwards. And yes, Palmer scoring in a European final is a massive achievement for him, and quite rightly so. But the way in which Saka, I think, does it on such a consistent basis, does turn up in these big games. You know, first game back, Liverpool, bang, goal, gives Arsenal the lead in that game. And that, I think, sometimes will be where Palmer has to learn to grow. Last season, Chelsea were a team in transition under a different manager, and they've chucked so much money at different players, different talents. Eventually, one of them's going to come good. Palmer has come good last season, but I think there is an element of him standing out as well amongst other players that were underperforming, which obviously boosts his profile. But I think that Arsenal, tactically, yes, they did well in shutting him down. Yeah, I think you're right to point out that he didn't have too much um, in terms of training in the week. But I do think there is something to be said about how narrow we set up so that he could effectively have those wide areas if he wanted to move into them. We forced him into those areas with Neto. They ended up getting their equaliser because Neto had switched to the other side because he was having so little joy. He was getting crosses in, sure. But those chances they created that Gusto definitely should have taken away when he got that header in that moment. They came from moments where we had forced them into low like low frequency, low high chance opportunities. And that's a credit to the defence and to the way we set up. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, Neto's goal came from him coming from out to in. So I think what we did in trying to make them go wide for most of the game was, was successful. And I think if Arsenal could have their choices of, do you want to have the ball centrally or wide? We'd rather, have, we'd rather allow them to have it wide because if you cross it, we are confident that with Saliba and Gabriel and Raya's ability to claim crosses, you can cross all day long. We'll probably be all right in that sense. Um, and, and, and I think... In the first half, I noticed towards the back end of the first half, Cole Palmer was doing what he suggested. He, he was drifting wide and deep to get the ball because he, he couldn't get it. Yeah. That was, I think, a reflection of how well we were doing in terms of keeping him away from our box. Because if you let him, a bit like Odegaard, if you let him on the half turn in and around our box, you're dead. You know, I don't rate Jackson that highly, but they've got something going on there. So I think we did a really good job in just keeping him and keeping them in areas that were low percentage uh, chances. I mean, he had two stunning chances at two free kicks. I mean, one after the other in a way. Mm -hmm. And after the first one didn't go in, he thought, OK, he's lining up for a second. I mean, and it's even better position. And both of them hit our walls. Was that more him or was that more us? He's doing the poor free kicks. Yeah, just two poor free kicks. Mm. I, I think the real, the real... I think there was a moment in the game that was an underrated turning point, And it was Malo Gusto's header. But also him getting injured. Mm because I think he stopped making runs after that. And making runs on that side would have supported Palmer in a better way. And I think his third man running to create that extra player, I thought was really 
really missed by Chelsea. So his ankle turned. And if you, again, I rewatched the game, but I got this feeling of he disappeared after that moment, offensively. You know, because I think he's a really good player. And much like our players, they need those support line running, our better players, to allow them to devastate the opposition. Odegaard needs it, Saka needs it, we spoke about that. How we connect from fullback areas is really important. On the other side, I thought Timber made a few first phase runs to get in behind, and he got better offensively the game went on. And I think, again, it allowed us to get up the pits. When you, you're having people playing outside of your shape, like mm -hmm. we did to them, mm -hmm. People who make those brave runs to run through distort the game a little bit. And I thought they missed Gusto. Cole Palmer missed him. So he did what we said. He said, I better get on the ball then. I'm having a bit of a stinker here. Let me have a touch. I don't care where it is, mm. but we're thinking, yeah, you can have a touch on over the there. Line, you can yeah. really have that yeah. touch there. Yeah. And that's just a, the, the two and pros of any game. So. so then I'm going to swing it back round to that near goal at the very, very end. Should we have won the game? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm not ready to talk about this shit. Um, <laughs> Emotionally, I think, I'm not ready. I think there are people like Clive that are um, <laughs> kind of justifying this to themselves in a way and making themselves feel better by thinking it was offside. <laughs> I need to tell you that I don't think it was. Um, there are two. There are two sides at the moment. There are some people saying that it is offside, and then some yeah. people are saying that it's not. If it had gone in, we would have found out because VAR obviously would have given us the the evidence to show whether or not it got. It, it would have been a goal from. The images that I've seen and from, you know, it's a lot of people mocking up obviously different lines and putting their own images on there. I've seen some pretty high tech images of it. It looks onside. I think it's onside. Um, and the trailing leg of Kukurea, where his foot is, and because Saliba's leaning forwards, and obviously when you're leaning, the, the lines will look slightly distorted because of perspective. Saliba looks onside. By the way, who's the guy that plays the pass to Saliba in that moment? Do you remember? Odegaard, was it? Odegaard, 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 yeah, it's Odegaard who plays the ball. And again, it's Odegaard being that creative mm -hmm. figure in the Arsenal mm -hmm. team and creating that position. As Odegaard's playing it, Trossard's running in behind. And I'm not going to criticise Trossard for taking the shot. I think that's something that maybe is a little... You could talk about awareness. I think in the 90th, last kick of the game, if you don't, you're not too aware of what's going on in the same way around you. You see a ball coming across the box. You've got a goalkeeper between you and the net. You're going to go and take that shot if you've got the opportunity. I will criticise the execution yeah. of the chance, for sure, because he should do much better. And to be honest, of all the team players in Arsenal's team, I was just you bang on Trossard being our, our best I finisher. Agree, yeah. And this last few games, and I don't know if it's a, a response and a knock-on from him playing more interiorly, if that's had a, an impact on his confidence. He doesn't look the same Trossard last season when... We need a goal against Bayern Munich. He rocks up and scores. We need a goal at home against Porto in the Champions League. He rocks up and scores. I usually would bank on Trossard taking those types of chances and getting kind of the, the, the touch. And you know, it's an, it's an inside of the boot. You want to angle it away from the keeper so it goes across him and into the bottom right-hand corner. And that's what he tries to do. But then on the replays, you just see Havertz there. And you're like, if you just know that Havertz is there and you let that ball run, and if there's again. one person you want scoring a 90 plus minute winner at Stanford Bridge, it's Kai yeah. Havertz. I needed that celebration. I needed that celebration. I went, I'm that so was gutted it so was all sweet. Yeah. Okay. Especially after, obviously, the goal early, well, the mm. non goal earlier. Yes, so, yeah. Clive, there was some eye rolling, there was some head shaking, there he was some side I eyes. <laughs> Go on. No, 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 to be fair, Trossard's a very hard player to read, isn't he? he mm. When he starts, he's 50 50. When he comes off the bench, because I thought, his old overall performance when he came on was excellent. And the pass into Odegaard was Trossard round the corner, mm -hmm. and it was an unbelievable pass. And he then follows his pass. So he's excited now. So the Odegaard flips it out to Sleeva, and Trossard's going to pass. He's thinking, if that ball's coming, I'm on the run, I'm going to slot it. So I can't blame him for going for it. He just didn't take it. And Mr. After Timer here can say that, see, Havertz behind, and I'm thinking, but we were thinking all sorts of things, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, how about to just scored? I'm not sure I'd have made call time today. So I'll tell you that, <laughs> <laughs> tell you that for sure. Um, but um, yeah, it's 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 just a shame. We've had a few margins go against us this season. A few. A few, and we can decide who we want to blame. We can decide if we're being refereed differently. We can decide that in August our captain goes off the national break. We don't see him for ten weeks because he gets injured, and we can't really foresee that level of time out but I just I would have liked that margin to go our way you know I thought the team really grew into the game and showed a level of real offensive desire to to get that winning goal so 
disappointed we didn't get the, the break. However, really encourage that within the team, there seemed to be a spirit to come back mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. okay, this is what we're trying to achieve again. We're not just playing, we're not mix and matching to make up for people who are on this pitch, but generally not fit enough to play. So we're making do at the moment. And it felt in that last period that we were back to being ourselves and really taking people to task. So I, I've walked away, despite Tom's iPad there, with the, off, <laughs> with the offside line, I've walked away feeling quite positive. <laughs> so then on a positive note, Mikel Marino was showing some positive signs, wasn't he? Yes. Mm. So I think that... <laughs> I think the end of the game was better from Marino. In the early point when he came on, I was missing Declan Rice immediately, mm -hmm. almost, I felt. Um, and Mar I think what's unfair um, is that Marino has not had a pre-season. He's got injured immediately. And for players, when you're missing pre-season and then coming into a new team and getting injured straight away, mm -hmm. the odds of you catching up to your fellow teammates in terms of fitness, in terms of adaptability, understandable nature of everybody else on the side, it is near impossible. I, mean, I was speaking to Theo Walcott in the summer. That's not a flex, by the way. But I was speaking to Theo yeah, Walcott in the summer about this. <laughs> and I remember when he, he I asked him, because he missed a pre, you remember when he got his knee injury um, and the infamous kind of celebration to the yes. Spurs fans that he did. I asked him, I said, well, that pre-season when you came back, and he effectively stopped me and was like, you don't come back. You, you do not make up ground on your teammates if you've missed pre-season. And so I do think that there's a lot of conclusive thoughts being spoken about Marino so early in his time at Arsenal about what he's going to give us, whether he's a good enough signing. But actually, I thought that we saw, as you pointed out, in the last few moments of the game against Chelsea, there were some really encouraging points. He was calm in a really high-intensity moment, some really good passes out to the wide areas, pushing us forwards, which is what you want from a midfielder. You don't want them to take the safe pass. The amount of times Chelsea played safe passes backwards, I was feeling for their fans because they kept playing the safe ball backwards every time I wanted them, if I was a neutral, to push forwards. But Marino kept on trying to force us up the pitch, and I think that was definitely worthy of comment. I mean, I think I'll start by saying I'm glad we've got him. Yeah. I think he's a really good player with qualities that I think will benefit us in the long term. Um, but I don't think he started particularly well for the reasons you've outlined. Mm. I think some of his performances, and even yesterday, have been slightly inflated. I think he'll come good. And I look at him the same way I looked at Ilkay Gundahan when he joined City. He didn't start well. His first six months, even season, he did not start well. But I could see the qualities in him that I'm like, this is a really good player. He's just not playing particularly well. And look how that's worked out. So I'm not here to write off Marino and say, this is a bad signing. Why have we got him? There's no value in having him in yeah. our team. But so far, the games I'm watching... I, I, I'm not seeing it yet. And I think it's very, very fair to say that the reasons you <coughs> outlined are the reasons why. But I have a feeling we're not going to see the best of him until maybe next season. I think he might have to treat this season as almost a pre-season to really get himself right for next season because I'm, I'm not seeing what other people are seeing in terms of performances. The qualities and attributes, I see what he's good at. He's a presence, he's good in the air, um, he's brave on the ball. I love all that and Mikel Arteta loves that. But I don't think that's translated yet into, yeah, that was a really good game from him, in, 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 my, in my opinion. Do you think it needs to be as long as all the way until next season? Or it can't be more of like a Kai Havertz maybe thing not. where... Maybe another couple of months. To get speed. In. Maybe, maybe. He's not I, a young player, so... He, he's not, but maybe in my <clears> mind, I've kind of just written it off in terms of we're going to see the real Marino next mm. season because I'm not sure Partey will be there next season. So maybe mm. there'll be some reconfiguring of that three in the midfield next year. I hope it comes before next year, of course. Yeah. But I'm just not seeing the quality translate to performances yet. Clive has something to say. I think he does. <laughs> I, I think he does. <laughs> I do. Uh, I think, um, again, one, one of the reasons why... No, 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 you've not been harsh at all. Uh, one of the reasons why I came away feeling positive is I tend to look forward to the horizon. And there, there are key people you need to invest in in the, in the team. right? So when you look at the team contract, you've got a £100 million pound set midfielder and people debating what his best position is. Marino's come in and everyone in their mind just said, Marino, Odegaard, Rice, that's going to be the midfield. Contractually, it's, that's going to be the midfield. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, Jordan, Thomas Pye's last year of his contract and Jorginho's last year of his yeah. contract. So it's going to be a level of evolution in that space. So how is this going to change? And the way I look at the game is, if you draw a line down the middle of the pitch, and Rice has played the left side of that line and Partey played on the right side of that line. Now, if Rice goes to the right side of that line, 
rather than having Rice doing two jobs up and down, if he does two jobs on that right-hand side, inside and out, what this does for the evolution of the team is it maybe starts Bukayo Saka defending in mm -hmm. his right corner mm -hmm. by the corner flag all the time. Because if you have a player like that, at some point you have to invest in him. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at, look at Mo Salah. You don't see him by the corner flag defending, mm -hmm. do you? So I said something last night on something else I was on. I said, Rice moves and becomes Jordan Henderson for Arsenal. By that I mean he underpins yeah. Yeah. Mm. Salah and Trent. And he was just there in the middle and he did all their dirty work mm -hmm. and water carrying. And that allowed Trent to be who he was and that allowed Salah to be who he is. Right? So, so that's the evolution. So for that left-sided player, what must he have? And this is why I'm so encouraged. He must be able to play an all-round game. Playmaking, passing, still be strong, but move the ball forward. If somebody is primarily a defensive stopper, the other guy's got to be a passer. And Marino can pass. Yep. And he can manipulate the ball. And I was going, there it is. There's the clarity. There's the evolution. Because if you have those two there, then you can start to move your fullbacks to engage. You can have Califuri is quite forceful. You've got Timber and White who are quite forceful. So the next evolution of Arsenal, I saw it yesterday. For the first time, I thought, OK, now I know why. Now, previously, in our previous setup, I'm looking for an Eze in that role mm -hmm. or uh, yeah. a Michael Elise to be in that role just because we were lacking creativity. But now Odegaard comes back and my requirements have changed because the balance is there. Mm. So it's not just the preseason that he's missed, Tom. We haven't seen him with Odegaard. Yeah. We saw him once yeah. for what, 20 minutes. I don't think they played together at all. Have they yeah, played this together? season. This season. Oh, yeah, maybe. Like, 20 minutes we've seen them together. Yeah. And a forgetful 20 minutes. <laughs> it, looked, it looks all right. It looks yeah. all right. It, towards the end, it looks OK. So that, to me, is why I'm so encouraged going yeah. forward. You know? What do you mean your requirements have changed? Well, my requirements on the player has changed. Because I think when you see him, you think, what is he going to be? Is he just going to hit the box? Is he just going to do what Havertz did last year? Which he probably is going to mm. do that. But he can do more on the ball. Because what Havertz used to do when he's in midfield, he's received the ball knock it off and disappear into the box. But he can play maybe from there. And I think we're getting a better version of the Havertz left day exper experiment, but didn't quite work. We're getting a better version of that, far more all round, yet he can still hit the box and be an aerial presence. So I see, I see, the, I see the promised land. Mm. I saw it yesterday for the first time. <laughs> it's got to come to fruition. I'm not trying to write off um, Thomas Party or Georgina, by the way, because Thomas Party for me has been our best midfielder this yeah, season. Yeah, I would agree. Right? But you have to look forward, don't yeah, you? You have so. to look forward. And it doesn't mean, look, Liverpool have Curtis Jones, Slobosai, McAllister, Gravenberch. They have four mm. top level midfields with Harvey Ellett, who's injured. Mm. We have to be able to do the same thing. So these players are not thrown away. I think as well, I think a lot of people want to quickly write off Arsenal's summer window that included Marino and say, what we did in that window, we need to do more. And to a degree, I, I would agree. I think we, we needed more. Unfortunately, Arsenal didn't get the money in until the last two days of the window to be able to do more. And fans will be like, well, we should have spent that money anyway. No, it was coming in. But with PSR, it's a very tricky minefield to navigate. If we don't sign anybody in January, which may be something we'll talk about later, it's a different conversation. But Arsenal's left side last season was the area where I looked at and I, that's where there's a, a gap for potential to grow into. You look at the right, you've got Odegaard, White, Timber potentially coming in this season as well, and Saka. It's like, you are set there with your starters. Mm -hmm. Left-hand side, Martinelli last season wasn't as good as he was in 22-23. Mm -hmm. You've got Declan Rice and Havertz sharing that role across the season. We worked out Havertz wasn't the guy. Declan Rice moves into that position and I think impresses, but I still, for me, in the long term, want to see Rice being our anchor and our number six and our Rodri. Mm -hmm. And then at left-back, you've got different players, Tomiyasu, Kivy or Zinchenko playing there this season. Timber's come in and played there and I like Timber. I like him a lot. But Calafiori for me is a player that since he got injured against Shakhtar, that's where my heart sunk more so than Odegaard's absence against Liverpool. Because when he went out against Shakhtar, I was like, not having Calafiori against Salah, which we then see Luis Skelly coming on in the second half of that game to defend against him because we don't trust Zinchenko to do that job in the same way for whatever reason. But Calafiori's link up and progression and partnership with Martinelli is also better. I think Martinelli's boosted when Calafiori plays. And I think that not having Calafiori, not having Marino clicking and working because he's not fully fit, not fully integrated yet, 
I think Arsenal did work in the summer to improve their left-hand side, but we've just not been able to see the fruits of that labour yet. But maybe we will. I just hope that from a points tally perspective, it's, it's not too late. So you just mentioned, obviously, about we haven't got Calafuri at the moment. And right. I feel like this injury conversation is something that we are having way too much. And I really hope that we stop. <laughs> but obviously, we did see Saka and Declan Rice both come off. I just want to wrap them both up in cotton wool. Who do we think, then, is going to go away for international duty? It's, you know, Arsenal's favourite, favourite few weeks. Um, I, I, I've been told that it's likely that Saka will, will go. Mm -hmm. Um, Declan Rice, less so. I'm, I'm not sure about whether he'll be called up or not. Um, and we'll see what happens with Odegaard. I, I'm, I'm with you. I would like them to, to all stay back in, in London <laughs> and get ready for the Nottingham Forest game. But the reality is, is they're three big players for their two nations. Mm. Um, so if you're their national managers, you're saying, oh, and at the bare minimum, I need you in the building. <laughs> Whether I play you or not, we can work on that. But I need you to at least attend and report for duty. So I see it from that point of view, but from an Arsenal point of view, yeah, if we're going to get back into this title race, of which I'm not sure we will, but we'll get to that, mm -hmm. we need all our players now back fit and ready to, ready, ready to go on a run. And they're three, three of, our, of, our, of our best players. Yeah, I think health and fitness is key. I think when we see a team sheet, we saw a team sheet yesterday, we all look at it, absolutely fantastic. Let's go, let's go take them. But let's look a little bit deeper into that team sheet, shall we? Mm -hmm. Ben White, he's not fit. We all know that. For, for, for close Ben White watchers, who is literally an unbelievable athlete, he's not storming up and down, is he? Yeah. So he's playing conservatively. Timber, we know, struggles late in games. And on the goal, he couldn't quite get out. So Saliba's gone out. Mm -hmm. And we didn't reorganise second phase on the goal. It's just fitness. Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> just fit, when you can't run, you can't run. And um, it's just fitness. So he's not quite right. Declan Rice, we know he didn't train. So he wasn't right. You know, Odegaard, we know he wasn't right. I don't know how he did what he did. Yeah. You know? And Saka, you know, he, he for me, he's overburdened and overplayed. And so, and Havertz, I mean, Havertz literally is bleeding for the cause. I mean, he, 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 he needs, yeah. if you look at him, you'd say that he's basically overplayed. Again, another one's overplayed mm -hmm. that seems to be a little bit fatigued. So we have the names of the team sheet that gives you comfort, but we're not at full power. I think that's what Arteta was saying afterwards. I need to get these players up to the level so we can have, be consistent over a game and hold, not have Saliba go out to the left back. And so we keep our shape centrally and we can press on to Neto and so he mm. can get the shot. These details really do matter, you know, and I think that's where we're falling down. And that's why we conceded 12 goals this year. At Liverpool, I've only conceded six. These details really do matter. Stability at the back, the end of the Liverpool game, we all know the back four that ended that game. If we had a back four, it ends the game yesterday, we don't, we beat, we, we beat yep. them. We beat them. It's, it's as simple yep. as that. So it does matter that stability. Because Liverpool has stability at the back of selection and health, and we don't. And it, it's a problem. It's a huge, it's a huge problem. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. And some fans will argue that Arsenal should do more in the market to deal with depth in that same way. I've got some question marks. I know, I think you can point to injuries. I think you can point to controversial yeah. decisions as valid reasons why Arsenal well, have not got as many points as they should perhaps have. But I think there is a third factor that I'm curious to ask about, which is why isn't Jorginho getting more minutes yeah. at the moment? Yeah, totally. Is there a question mark there? Mm -hmm. Because I thought he was really good against Preston. Mm -hmm. I know it's only Preston, but that's all I've got to go off because that's really all that he's played against. Zinchenko is another one. Excellent game against Preston. I thought really showed what we've missed in some ways. I really liked his progression. I liked the way he combined on the left-hand side, I liked the way he moves into midfield. And I think he gives us an extra body in midfield at times where you need to kind of like suffocate the opposition at times. So you can kind of rotate the ball from left to right much more comfortably and go through in a more direct sense. And those two, and I know Zinchenko, I'm not saying Zinchenko or Jorginho is the answer to turning Arsenal where they are now to title challenges, but there is an underutilization, I think, of some players in the squad at the moment but I'm coming from an outside perspective. I don't know what the reason for that is. I don't know if Jorginho is suffering with some issues. I don't know if Zinchenko, obviously, we know has had some issues this season already, has come back and not fully fit. So I'm curious as to whether you think those two in particular have been underused. Jorginho, for sure. Yeah. I, I think especially when I go back to kind of like players that have that pass, Odegaard's not in the team. He does have that pass. He hasn't got the legs of Odegaard, mm. but he's got the brain. 
of Odegaard um, and the execution of, 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 of making the kind of passes that Odegaard can make as well. So yeah, I agree. I think Jorginho would have liked to have seen him utilise a bit more. I mean, Zinchenko, I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of Zinchenko. I, I don't think we've seen a good game. I agree he was great. Again. He was very good against, against Preston. But I can't remember the last time I saw a game where Zinchenko really impressed me. Mm. I know he had a difficult year last year with injuries and all of that. But I, I feel like, and it's been said, I think we've moved past Zinchenko. I, I, I think he takes more than what he offers. I think we talk about him coming in, into midfield and what he brings on the ball. But I think you lose <coughs> someone as a defensive at times liability um, when, when, when he's in there. And so I think even as cover, I'm always nervous when, 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 he, when he plays. So less so as Zinchenko, but for sure, definitely Georgina, I think, could have played some more minutes. So now we're going to move on to the title race. I can't wait to talk about this part. So the media narrative is always going to be about the title race, obviously. So let's have an honest, and I mean an honest discussion on is it still on for Arsenal? Because there are already articles out saying it's not. I think we're still in the running, in my opinion. I, I, I really do think, I think we're still so early on in the season. Anything can happen. I know the figures are out there. I know the goals, you know, I know the points are happening, but I still think we're in for a chance. I think, I think for me, it's just about seeing performance. Because mm -hmm. we're not playing well, we're not winning anything. Right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I think the performance turning the corner in Milan, a little bit, <laughs> in Milan, uh, and, um, and then into obviously Chelsea, I, th I can see the light again, I can see it. If we get our performance levels right and we get onto a run, then let's see what happens. I mean, we're still discovering who Liverpool are. I think they've got a lot of stability. But at the, week at the weekend, they lost Trent for a while. We don't know how long that's going to be. A big factor for them has been Canate. I think he's really stepped up massively mm -hmm. and he stayed injury free. But for those regular Canate watchers, he's never used to be able to play three games in a week and he's now doing that. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, just have to see what happens there when they lose stability. For us, I, I, think, I think we're still there. I think the most important thing is just to get our levels back. Mm -hmm. When our levels are back, everything takes care of everything. You haven't got to worry about anything else. You know, man, you, everyone has their frailties. Man City have quite an aging midfield at the moment. It's getting run through. We have instability and discipline problems, and we don't execute enough, and we don't score enough goals. That's the problems we have at the moment. But things change during the season, they, as the flow of the season goes on. I, I, I can see us coming back. Where that will end, I don't know. I almost don't care. Let Liverpool be the favourites. Let them mm. carry the, the rucksack of favouritism on their back. Let them have a target on their back and see how they handle it. Now, I do think Liverpool as an institution are used to being at the top end of the game. They used to be in Champions League quarterfinals and semi-finals and finals. So they're not strangers to this moment. However, let's see how they go when the light shines on them and people start to assess how they're playing and we'll see what happens then. I think there's an element, though, of a reluctance to shine the light as much on other teams. Though Arsenal, always, you get that sense that the pressure's on us. 100%. You feel like the <laughs> emphasis... What is that? Yeah, it, it is it true, isn't it? It needs to be a university topic on this. <laughs> <laughs> Man City have Double lost... Double degrees, isn't it? <laughs> Man City have lost to Bournemouth and Brighton in this run. Mm -hmm. Arsenal drew with Brighton and lost with Bournemouth. I've not seen anywhere near the level of scrutiny from the wider, you know... Well, Gary Neville said we went to 10 men against both those teams. We should have beaten them. Mm. But I think... I think sorry to cut you. <laughs> no. I, I just didn't... I think the, the, the slight difference in the comparing Arsenal with other teams like City and like Liverpool yeah, is right. that City and Liverpool in recent years have won titles in of European course, Cups. Of course. So if you're supposed to be a big club, and we're talking that we're a big club, mm. it's 20 years. That's a long time with no league title. Mm. So if, if, the, if the world is hearing from Arsenal fans, we're a big club, but you've got no league. We take the Mickey out of Spurs because mm. they're not a big club, right? In, in my view. <laughs> How long has it been for them? It's the major. But if we're saying we're a big club and it's 20 years, I, I think there's a different level of scrutiny that will come on Arsenal because if City drop the ball, if City lose a game, if City don't win the title, it's like, OK, that can happen. But they've just won a treble a couple of years ago and four back-to-back -back titles. When Arsenal drop the ball, it's like, well, OK, this is... You're telling us you're a big club, but yet you're losing to, to Bournemouth, with, with, albeit with 10 men. So I think that's the reason why we get a little bit more scrutiny than, say, City. It's because City have got, if you like, credit in the bank. Mm. We don't. I understand where you're coming from. I, I think there is an element on Arsenal, the label of a big club, 
It's very broad. Arsenal have been playing catch up to Liverpool and City for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, more so City, mm-hmm. the money that's been spent. You know, you think about Klopp coming in and, you know, prior to, to Pep Guardiola, I think it was 20, 2014, 2015, and Pep Guardiola came in in 2016. So you're looking at, I think maybe slightly later than that, uh, 2016, 17, around that period that they both came in. Pep Guardiola spent, since he arrived, far more than obviously Arsenal has spent. He likes to use in his press conference the whole, we've spent less than the last five seasons. It's very specific you talk about those five seasons because that's where the money suddenly dips. But the reality is that you talk about the Arsenal project and where they are. Arteta and what he inherited compared to what Guardiola and what he inherited, you talk about the work they've done, the work he's done, you've still got De Bruyne, you've got Company, you've got Aguero, you've got David Silva and inherited that. Arteta inherited the best players in that team were young. Saka as a teenager still. You know, you think about Saliba, had to Smith-Rowe. bring him into the team. Smith Rowe, of course, as well. And then you look at Liverpool and Arna slot, and I can I can see the headlines already. If say if Liverpool were touch wood, they won't, but if they were to go on and win the title, there'll be a lot of accusations towards Arsenal in the sense of new managers come in and taking Liverpool straight to the title. The reality is, is this Liverpool team has been competing for the title, as you pointed out, for many, many years up to this Top point. Top and he's inherited such a brilliant group of players, world-class stars. And this isn't taken away from Slot himself. He's still a good manager. What he did at final was an excellent job and he's coming into a setup which is ready-made for him. Whereas you look at Arteta and what he inherited, he had to take that forward, cultivate into something that's his own with Edu, who now has left. And maybe we'll talk about that later. He's moving on and that's going to be an interesting reality. But then you go back to this idea of Arsenal or a big club. Where's the scrutiny at? I do feel like the scrutiny is on us more, but in the same way, I don't necessarily feel like that's fair in the same way because the work we've had to do in these five years to get to where we are and compare that to, say, City losing at Bournemouth, City losing at Brighton, is there is a difference between the two. But, but hang on, but isn't there a false equivalence in that this is this is fifth season? We're not mm. comparing Mikel Arteta coming in in year one with, yeah. Klopp, uh, with Slot so in year one. We're comparing Slot in year one, albeit with a great setup mm. and a team ready to go, with a manager, Mikel Arteta, who's had five years to get his team. Mm. That, that's, that's for me where I, I, I don't think... That's all it takes, though, to get that team. I, I agree, but in your fifth year, yeah. you shouldn't be behind a manager, albeit who's come in with a great team ready to go. Mm. You shouldn't be, in my opinion, nine points behind. Even with everything that's happened this season? Well, Even with the red cards, the injuries. Well, the red cards, in my opinion, are self-inflicted. I'm not... I'm, I, I think the red cards are red cards, so I, mm. no one forced you to get the ball away. Nobody forced you to drag, as it was Ever, Ever Nilsson down at mm. Bournemouth. Those were things that we did, right? All right, the bad luck and other decisions may go up, may, may, you, we, can, we can bring up. But the point I'm making is that Liverpool have got the best goalkeeper in the world injured. They've got their best finisher injured. Mm. City have got a Ballon d'Or winner out injured for the season. Mm. The point has come row. back. Sorry? And have lost four in a row. They have, but the point I'm making is that we all have injuries. So I don't think, it's the, I don't think we can, whilst it's impacted us, of course mm. it has. It's impacted City. They've had their issues as well. So I think we need to just kind of take accountability of what what we're doing. And, and rather than thinking, oh, Slot's getting an easy run, look at the fact that he's had five years, Arteta, to get to this stage and he's mm. behind Slot. My f- only and first disagreement with Clive would be in that I don't think we're going to win the title this season. I think, I look at I look at like an Olympic race, Olympic final, right? It's 200 metres and we're, we're, an, we're a runner. And on the left, you've got Usain Bolt. And on the right, you've got Carl Lewis. We are 80 metres into the race, but we're behind. We're 30 metres behind Usain Bolt. You're not going to make that up. You're in the race. You're in the race, but you're not winning that race. And anyone that knows athletics knows that Bolt is traditionally a bad starter anyway. You've started poorly and you're behind (laughs) him early. You're not going to catch him. So it's not me being negative and me writing off the intent. We should just give up and let's pack our bags and go home. No, we still fight. We try and beat Forrest and then we try and beat West Ham. Then you try and put a run together. But for me, those that are saying, oh, it's November, how can you say the title race is over? For me, it's missing the point. The evidence and the numbers suggest that this isn't 15 years ago where you could lose six games and win a title. This is now where I don't think 90 points will be required, mm. but mid-80s, you can't lose really more than four games this season, five. We've lost two already. So between now and May, we'll probably lose two more, that's likely. Liverpool will drop points, but my fear is, can we make up those points? I'm not so sure. So whilst I still want us to win the title, we've got to fight on. I think my, my, my rational head says, look at the last few seasons. Can we put the kind of run together that's going to make up those nine points? That's before you get to City, who are five points ahead. 
So I, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just being <laughs> realistic. Mm -hmm. I don't think Arsenal in May will lift the Premier League title, unfortunately, because of... We can all hope and say, yeah, we believe, but hope, we can all hope. But the actual analysis I think we need to be applying is, looking at previous years, do we really think we can make up that difference and really eat into that lead? I, I fear not. I did say I wanted a, an honest debate about Sorry, this. I've, no, been a, bit, I've been a bit miserable say, I did Sorry. say. Well, then, do you not think, because obviously we've got our next six games coming up. So we have Forest at home, West Ham away, Man United at home, Fulham away, Everton at home, and then Crystal Palace away. <clears throat> do we have to win them all? And do you think we'll win them all? Yes and no. See, okay. see, see my, my view is, I'm not sure we're going to win the title. And that's why I, I didn't say we we're going to win the title. But no, you didn't, I, to be fair, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but what I... What I did say for sure, we're not winning anything unless we get performance right, you know? And what I saw was performance coming back. And so when I see performance coming back, the art of the possible is out mm -hmm. there. And then it becomes, OK, this is what we can do. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what we are going to do, but without that level of performance and togetherness and spirit, we're not going anywhere. Well, we're not going anywhere. Look at the group of teams right on us, right behind us. Unless we get our performance right, we're not going to finish in top four. That's the truth of it. That is the truth of it. So we've got to get our game back, get our health back, get our fitness back. As for Liverpool and Man City, I'm, I'm look, Arsenal, Arsenal are a big business, right? People don't talk about us. That's the truth of it. We know that. We've got a crazy fan base. They're from all parts of the world. And if you say anything against them, they're going to come at you, right? They're going to assemble right in your timeline. And so basically, we are business. So we are going to get spoken about. We, for me, I think unfairly we've become a refereeing narrative mm -hmm. to promote new rules, which I think is unfair. I have never seen a player sent off by the corner flag stopping a quick free kick when the ball was three yards away. I've never seen that. He wasn't before. sent off. Yeah, a second he wasn't yellow. Sent off. Second he was sent off. No, he wasn't sent off. No, he, he was, was booked. No, no, no. But he was. It's was the booked. decision to yeah. send him off. But that's a consequence issue. of two yeah. yellow cards. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't but, sent off. Let's be, what, let's be just what, be. What I've seen. What do you know what I mean? Was, you'll, you'll never see it again. We, we've, be, never we've, be, again. we've become. We've become that narrative around that, and because we are business, good business for certain YouTube channels, etc. People are going to exacerbate that. And that's creating an environment where the pressure has come on top of us with the injuries. And so we have to come out of that. And we're coming out of that. And that's what we can control. We can control the next thing we do. Mm -hmm. We can't control the things that have gone. And so we have to, in, in my mind, what I'm trying to do as an individual is try to shut out that noise. Because when I let it in, it damages my experience. It damages how I look at football. It damages my enjoyment. And trust me, people out there do not care that Ben White's carrying an injury. They do not care that Odegaard, he was on the team sheet. They do not care that Declan Rice got broken to it. They don't care about Saka being booted up in the air and not getting no protection. They do not care about our feelings. They don't. They care about what we do next and how we win. And, it, and that's how we got to look at it. We have to start winning. When you win four matches, anything's possible. When you don't, it's, the debate is not going to happen. And what underpins winning is getting our performance right, getting our team structure right, getting our players in the right areas of the pitch, playing in the territory we want to play in, and being far more forceful. To see Saliba have the courage to drive on that left-hand mm. side, that is a message that we are back, that we are on our way back. Because we weren't doing that three weeks ago. Mm. He wasn't playing that well. He had a rough last week national break, and he's come back, and he hasn't been tip-top. So this is all part of our story. So, hey, for me, I'm positive we're going to improve. Where that improvement lies, where it takes us, I don't know. But neither do you. You don't. Can I just quickly <laughs> add as well to that? If, if we do agree that it's unlikely we'll be champions in May, mm. I think what's important is that we don't let that bleed into cup competitions. No. We can't, we can't, oh, the title's unlikely. So, because Mikel Arteta's record in the cups, it, it's, it's horrific. It's really bad. So I think it's important that we don't just write off the season. Yeah. The league might, might be too far stretched now. But we can still win the Champions League. Mm. We can still win the FA Cup. We have to win the League Cup. So I think it's important that we don't... The season can be successful, even if the league campaign isn't. I don't like the energy that's around at the moment. There's a lot of people that are giving up. A lot of people saying the season's done. Okay. Arsenal season's over. I know it's all right, if it's like, but I'm in the, in the sense where I don't, like, we don't need that energy. Like, and I know the players maybe aren't... I can tell you the players do look at stuff. The players definitely are exposed to stuff on social media. And one thing that Arteta has done in these five years, you know, is, is the unity that didn't exist at all prior to him taking over. The fractures that were there have been 
you know, welded back together to nearly a full extent. To get it all the way, you need to win a title. And that will unify everybody around yeah. that. So, Tom, you live in the online world a lot. I, and, Don't tell my missus and, that, and, you, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know there is an undercurrent of people just waiting for this run. Of course. Waiting for this run. It disappoints me, if I'm honest with you. Uh, hey, look, we're, gonna, we're not playing. We haven't been playing great. They can't deny it. You can look at it any which way you want. We did it data-wise, statistically. We've got, we've got improvement to be had. However, I do feel disappointed that some people do just seem to relish these moments more than they do the mm. positive moments. Well, let me bring some context to that. So Arsenal at the moment are four points worse off in the fixtures that they have played this season compared to last season. Obviously, before the end of the year, we go to Fulham, where we lost last season. So there's an opportunity to drag that back to one point. All the other teams that we've got coming up this season, we did beat. Um, there's also, so by the end of the year, you could be one point worse off in the same fixtures from last season, which I think when you think about the mood at the moment is very different. It does rely on, as Clive says, our performances like against Chelsea building and getting better for that to happen. And also, at the moment, we have dropped 14 points so far. We dropped 20 by New Year's Eve last year. So if in these next six games, which aren't, you know, we're not foregoing, we're going to win them, we have to win them. But if Arsenal can drop less than six points between now and the end of the year, they will still be better off at the same stage than they were last season. And I think that's obviously the difference between Arsenal and Liverpool seasons, and I think Liverpool are quite fortunate to have had the fixture list that they've had, is that, and they still have to win those games, but Slot's been able to come in with that team, build up momentum, go into this tough run that he's got now with that momentum built, whereas Arsenal have had an incredibly challenging start to the season. It's been bumpy. It's been a roller coaster. We've taken hits both with player injuries and with points. And now the challenge is on Arteta to lift that team after this international break, treat it like our Dubai trip from last year, mm. which we really recovered from and went on a bit of a run. You've got to treat this two weeks in, in a way like a camp and then come back and attack these next six games because you could change the narrative completely in just the space of a few weeks. Oh, that magical Dubai trip. I mean, I would actually <laughs> love to know what really went down on that trip. But anyway, we've obviously discussed Liverpool. Let's obviously just have a little chat about Man City. They are off the back of four losses in a row. What do you make of their problems at the moment? Um, I think they're similar to, 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 to us in the sense that they've got key players out. Um, you know, going for a fifth title in a row. I mean, I, I, I was surprised they got the third and the fourth and... Going for a fifth, that, that must have an element. Uh, I think somebody mentioned some of their better players are now getting to an age where, you know, the impact on their bodies and their performance is going to be a thing. I don't think it's as big a crisis as everyone's making, out, making it out to be because those four defeats are spread across league and, and Europe. In Europe, they've lost, they got battered by sporting. They were the better team. They were actually the better team. They should have won That's that game. That's half now. They killed them. Oh, they battered them. Yeah. So, and even losing that game, it's not consequential. They're still in the Champions League. Of course, so. you say that, but I think we're just so not used to watching we're Man City not. lose. We're not. No one. We're not. But I think that if they can be... What's the gap between them and Liverpool? Four. Is it four points? Five. Five, four, five points. Yeah. If they can be in a crisis and they're five points behind Liverpool, I think they'll take five. that. <laughs> they'll take I, that. I, I think it comes back to stability again. They've conceded, I think it's 13 goals, I think, Tom, you should tell me. Uh, they've conceded a similar number to us. Um, and funny that, they got beat, but they didn't have Stones, Akanji, Aki, Diaz. Mm. They had Rico Lewis playing left-back, Carl Walker playing right-back, Guardiola playing centre-back, mm. and a young centre-back, I can't remember his Simpson name. Simpson Pusey. Simpson mm. Pusey, thank you, Tom, who is an outstanding young player mm. who does not need to be exposed to this right now. He needs to be coming on 20 minutes, end of game, when it's mm. already won. So he's holding them together. He got run, he got run past by Giocarez last week. And I feel for him, I hope Man City fans protect him because he's a top, top player. Mm. But they haven't got a stability in the back. Very similar to us in the last, in the last 10 minutes against Liverpool. Look at that back four, you know? And when you have that stability, when you have that consistent choice, you can do a lot of things. You can cover a lot of sins if you're not letting in goals, honestly. Mm. When, when Nunes flashes one into the car park, no one cares when you're not letting one in. Do you mm, see what I mean? Mm. And that's the key thing. When Martin any misses a chance, we all cry ourselves to sleep because we've let a couple in, right? Mm. So uh, then we questioned him and we want him sold, you know? So, um, and so... <laughs> some want him sold. And some want him sold. Thank you, Tom. You're on the online guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, yeah, I think that's where we are at the moment. But I, I, through my experience, I've learned that this is how seasons go. 
You know, Liverpool last year were doing really well, right with us. They were ahead of us. Suddenly, their finishing went cold. They couldn't score. And they let a few goals in on the, on the break. They, they, they lost some games or lost points in games, but they were totally dominant. They just couldn't find the back of the net. They were begging Jota to come back to try to be their best finisher. You go through phases in the season. And for me, because I know this, I'm not prepared to write off this season. Mm. I'm, I just want us to get to a rhythm where I can see our team again. And I think I start to see that against Chelsea. I think as well, coming to a transfer perspective with Manchester City, they're actually a good reference point for the summer because while we lost Erdegaard and everyone was talking about, you know, why didn't we bring somebody in or why didn't we decide not to loan out a player who everybody said wasn't good enough in Fabio Vieira um, or let Smith grow, Smith grow, et cetera. If you look at the business done by the three clubs in the summer, Liverpool brought in Chiesa mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. Man City brought in Savinho, who they effectively signed two years prior for their City football group from Twa, um, when they signed for Twa from Atletico Mineiro, I think it was. And they brought back Gundogan, mm -hmm. and that's it. Arsenal went out, and as we talked about already, tried to strengthen their left-hand side with Moreno and Calafiore, who have had their issues. But Manchester City sold Julian Alvarez, who was their best backup to Erling Haaland, didn't replace him. For years, Rodri has been their standout DM. They tried to bring in a replacement in Calvin Phillips that hasn't worked. It's so hard to replace those standout figures. If they lose Haaland to an injury, they're going to struggle. If they lose Rodri to an injury, if I'm saying this three or four weeks ago, they're going to struggle, and they have. So I think that that summer as well is a good template for Arsenal and Man City fans to see how difficult and challenging that window was. And you're seeing the impact on both Man City and Arsenal in terms of the big players that have been lost. Yeah, I think you, you triggered something in my mind there, actually, Tom, because I think uh, <laughs> you knew it, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I well, always do. The, the issue is, take our front three. So we've got our front three players in Havertz, uh, Martinelli and Saka. We're, we're fairly comfortable with those. We can debate. Mm. We can debate maybe a couple of things. But the three behind them, in Trussard, Sterling and Jesus. So Sterling, lone player, come in, Reese Nelson money, into the squad. You think being used enough? Mm. Debate. Trussard, does well. I'm not sure when he's going to do well, but he does well. <laughs> and then he, does, then he doesn't do well. Yeah. Right? And there's no grey. There is no grey with him. Mm. Capital Jesus, one of the team's captains, four time Premier League winner. Mm. Right? Nowhere. This is, this is a. So when you want to look at Arsenal and critique us, we've invested, we've, we've platformed people to be leaders in the group. When, when our skipper goes down, I want, I want to see you. I want to see, I judge people in adversity. Where are you? You know, where are you, Gabriel Jesus, right now? And if, I, people have bad games. That's not a problem with me. It's never a problem with me. No one plays well every single week. But there are times when you hope certain people will step up. And that's when you can judge Arsenal and say, Man City, have they haven't got a Gabriel Jesus. They haven't got an Alvarez. Mm. They are running a risk, a mm. huge risk. We have these players. And when other people go cold, where are you? That's my, that's my thing. That's my team talk now in this two-week gap. You need to show, you're, you're not in the Brazil squad anymore, not even close to being selected. You need to show up, because we've invested in you for these moments. These are the times we need to be honest as Arsenal people and say, we need more from certain individuals, while also recognising we get a little bit of injury luck and a little bit of referee disciplinary luck to get to add get some stability back to allow us to get the results that we need. Look, I don't think it's over just yet, guys. <laughs> so I don't, you know, whatever you guys have got to say, I don't think it's over just yet. I've had so many different facial expressions today from all of you. It's been really good fun. And that is all we've got time for this week. A huge thanks to Clive Palmer, Tom Canton and Jordan Jarrett-Bryan. We'll see you next week. And remember, trust the process.